go ahead and get started because I want us to get started on time and hopefully we will have enough time to, to kind of go through and answer questions and things of that sort. So good morning. We are here to talk about the K-12 education landscape and there's a panel of four and the order in which we will do this, we will start with Dan Teague. Dan, Dan Teague uh, from the North Carolina School of Mathematics and Science and also an NCTM board member. We will, then we'll move to Bria Ratliff, who is the president of the Benjamin Banneker Association. I'm sorry, past president <laughs> of the Benjamin Banneker Association. And then we'll move to uh, Marilyn Instructions, professor at Auburn University, former president of AMTE, past board member of NCTM, and doer of all things. <laughs> and, and I'm Robert Berry. I'm the president of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, as well as a professor of mathematics education at the University of Virginia. And so without taking up too much time, I'm going to let Dan get us started. And so Dan, I'm going to start with, start off with Dan. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Uh, as you can see from my opening slide, uh, if I had uh, heard Uri's presentation before I made it, I, I might have made a, a couple of different choices. Uh, but I'm gonna, <laughs> so I'm gonna repeat a little bit of what, what he said uh, last night. And, and uh, to get us started, I wanna talk about you know, how we got here uh, and where do we go from here. So as with Uri, the Sputnik was a big deal. I was, I was a young kid, uh, I was seven years old. Um, I can remember with my family uh, watching our first the U.S. first visible um, echo uh, uh, orbiting the Earth. We were out in our front yard. Everyone on our block was out in their front yard watching it move across the sky. Um, and this was a, a fundamental shock to the system um, and changed uh, mathematics um, into what we have today. Um, that the, at the time, the research had showed that children could learn uh, much more mathematics than we were teaching them. Um, uh, what wasn't discussed is whether or not they, uh, that set theory and linear algebra and uh, all the formal mathematical reasoning should be taught to uh, everyone. Uh, but the, the basic idea is the programs were designed for the most capable. And as if everyone was going to be a mathematical scientist or engineer. Um, and the process led to a sort of a step structure like this. Everybody goes in and at some point you decide I'm full, okay, my brain's full of math, and I'm gonna step off the track. Um, and if you end up at the top, then you can be a mathematical scientist and your life is going to be good. You have lots of options. Um, most uh, jobs at the time didn't require a lot of mathematical sophistication. Um, very creative arithmetic for most of us, some basic algebra. Um, but there wasn't, a, there wasn't a, a high need in most employment for calculus and beyond. Um, so if you dropped out at some point, it's sort of a no harm, no foul, that you learn some stuff you may not be able to use. Um, that's only to the good. Um, but what we did not think at all of was how people thought about their experience in mathematics. And again, we're paying for that today. We heard it in the last session when we go and, and people say mathematics was their worst subject, they hate mathematics, it um, was a burden to them and, and has been an obstacle all their lives. Um, that's part of what we created by having them take courses that were of no practical use to them um, and at some point get fed up and leave. Um, so this is a, a problem of our own creation. At the time, essentially uh, the first through 12th grade mathematics curriculum was a 12 year search for David Brasseau. Who's going to become a mathematician? And it was extraordinarily good at finding David Brasseau's. One of the reasons, uh, Jim Lewis's question about what about the, the professional mathematics community, the mathematical researchers, or do they need to be on board for us to be successful in our, in our endeavors? And the answer is absolutely yes, they do. They're interested in perpetuating the process that found them. There's a group that's very, very successful from this process. Um, in fact, that includes a lot of us. It found us. We're in mathematics as a result of this process. Um, in my high school, we had my 50th reunion earlier uh, 
this year, and almost no one went beyond Algebra 2. Uh, there was one section of pre-calculus, and there were two of us uh, who went, ended up taking calculus. But other than that, it was, it was, they were in the process, they dropped out at Algebra 2 because that's what they needed for the UNC college system, those who were going. Um, again, how they felt about it really wasn't important. Here's what we have today. People aren't dropping out at Algebra 2. There are 800,000 students taking calculus in high school. More than 100,000 of them before they reach 12th grade. So how does that happen? Well, not because they're all planning to be mathematical scientists. They're not. Why are they doing it? Why, <coughs> why, does, why is there this great push towards calculus? Well, primarily, I think, for college admissions. And one of my advisees um, a couple of years ago was adamant about taking BC calculus her senior year because she wanted to study psychology at Duke. You can't, turn, you can't study psychology at Duke without BC calculus. Is that because calculus is really important to the subject of psychology? No, you can't get into Duke to study anything without having BC calculus. And so all of the students who intend to go to these to, to selective schools, uh, now of course all of them don't, uh, th so th there's this push, this drive that they feel that they have to have this subject despite its irrelevance to their, I, their goals. And that's part of what we're gonna try to change. We're gonna try to say, no, there's a better way of doing this. There are winners and losers in the process. Uh, it advantaged some and damaged many. Um, and here's one of the big issues. And it's part of that pre PR conversation we were having earlier that there is a group that's advantaged by the system. And if you're gonna say, we're no longer gonna put all our emphasis and all our effort on you guys and finding who the future mathematicians and mathematical scientists are, we're gonna put energy into making mathematics work for everyone, they're gonna see that as a loss. They're not getting the attention that they used to get and they're gonna fight back. And these are oftentimes the more affluent part of your student population, and they're the more affluent parents, which have a little bit more power and ability to make trouble if they want to. And so just something to be considering, that how are we gonna address these issues prior to us rolling out whatever plans we're coming up with? Because those parents, we need to talk to those parents and get them to understand that your, your son and daughter are still gonna be just as well prepared as they ever were. Um, that it's not a loss to you if someone else gets some attention that they haven't heretofore gotten. I think that's really important to think about. Um, there are many things that are different now than back then. The need for mathematics in lots of different areas of employment and particularly in the biological sciences and the social sciences, which when I was in school were very amathematical. Mathematics had absolutely nothing to do with them. But now their mathematics, particularly network science, is fundamental to our understanding of modern biology and it's fundamental to our understanding of sociology and, and, and all of the social sciences. So mathematics is becoming more important for more people uh, for different reasons. Again, the students taking the advanced courses, when I was in high school, you only took calculus. If you, if you took first semester calculus only if you intended to take differential equations and multivariable calculus and linear algebra, it was a part of a structured plan for you. This was gonna be a part of my life. Uh, I need this as a working tool for me. No one took calculus as an elective, okay? <laughs> the vast majority, <laughs> so, so a course was created for those who were gonna use it as, their, as a, the basis for their future. That's the same course we're teaching today. But the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of students taking that course have no interest whatsoever in the follow-up courses. Um, and so again, there's a mismatch there. Even for our strongest students, there's a mismatch in terms of what we're giving them and what, what they need. And again, I'll, I'll reemphasize this several times, students' experiences in mathematics is vitally important to the field of mathematics, um, particularly those who leave early. How they felt about their experience is really important in terms of how they vote in terms of supporting your mathematics program. If you're gonna make some changes to your mathematics program and need funding to do it, 
These are the people who are going to decide whether it's worth their tax money to do it. And so there are ideas and feelings about mathematics and how value it is, valuable it is, is really, really important. This is from uh, Tracy Zager's Becoming the Math Teacher You Wish You'd Had. These are, this is a wordle of uh, how mathematicians think about mathematics, play, invent, passion, absorbing, and how mathematics teachers think about mathematics. <laughs> Alone, wrong, lost. Okay. Now, imagine the students. Wordle, what would it, what would it be? But, but again, this is, this is the fight that we're, we're doing, that there's this sense that it's, there's, it's, it's created as part of some grand testing procedure to figure out where we belong, and we're constantly being told, well, we don't belong here. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, again, that's something that we're, that these uh, pathways is trying to say, um, no, that's not true. Mathematics is really important, just not the mathematics that you've been seeing so far. Mathematics is quite varied and attends to all of their interests. Mathematical identity is super important. It's a person's changing view of him or herself in a social context, influenced by their experiences, personal history, and other events. Their mathematical identity, it's how they see themselves with respect. What's their relationship with mathematics? And building that mathematical identity is super important. That's why I'm such a big believer in mathematical modeling, because it really is one, one area where students' mathematical identities grow and blossom, and they see themselves as, I'm not as fast as everyone else, but I can be creative. I can think of new ways of doing things. I can think of things others didn't think of. I can blend my ideas with someone else's ideas and make it really good. Mm -hmm. This idea of I can do this um, is really, really important. Teachers' mathematical practices play a huge role in student mathematical identities and their feelings about mathematics. Alan Schoenfeld found that if you're teaching students in sort of the traditional lecture demonstrate then give assignments that students who are particularly good at mathematics and really like mathematics oftentimes bail out for a more interesting subject because they're not engaged in the process themselves. They're always borrowing your brain. What did the teacher tell me to do? Um, they like to use their own brains. There was a, a, a study um, a number of years ago, and it just escaped my mind who, who did it, um, but they were asking, social science majors and math and physics majors to sort of talk about uh, why they like what they're doing um, and what, why they don't like the math classroom. And they, the, s the sense of it was they, would, they said that, well, in the English classroom, we would read a book and the teacher would say, what did you think about it? They don't want to ask us about what some professional reviewer thought about it. What, were the, what do you think about it? What did you think was good? How would you change the last two paragraphs? In the mathematics classroom, nobody asks us what we think. It was what did Descartes think? What did Newton think? They were always borrowing someone else's brain. Um, and they really wanted to use their own brain. And again, that in mathematics, the active learning idea is to have them use their own brain. So mathematical identity is, again, super <coughs> important. And it plays this role in, once they leave, why do they think about mathematics and how do they think about themselves as The notion of ownership has also been mentioned before. Having the feeling that this is my subject, <coughs> this part of mathematics is my subject because it attends to the issues that I'm interested in. It relates to, to I'm really interested in political science. Well, there's mathematics that talks about that. I'm really interested in, pick your favorite subject. There's mathematics that talks about that. And so what I want to end with is how do you want your students to do mathematics? By remembering how, or by thinking about how? You want them to be creative, or just rememberers? And the way we structure this, these pathways, and the way we structure those courses that are, are part of those pathways, play a supreme role in tr determining which of these two ways students will leave high school mathematics and inner college mathematics thinking about these issues. <coughs> Thank you.
Next, we will have Bria Ratliff. She will come up and let's see if we can make. Ooh, there we go. Close this out. And this okay, Bria? All right. Good morning. All right, so my background is obviously K-12. Um, spent a lot of time teaching both, well, all, elementary, middle, and high school mathematics before being a curriculum director. I tell you all of that because I love professional development and I know that just sitting still in seats is not the best way to learn. So what I'd like you to do right now is put down your tablets, your computers, and your cell phones, and I'd like you to, as much as possible, form a line in the center of this room. It can be disjointed. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> OK. I see some people are still finding their way to the line, and so I will wait for you. So I want to ask you a series of questions. If the answer to the question I ask is yes, I'd like you to move one step closer to the wall that's to my right. If the answer to the question is no, then I'd like you to move one step closer to the wall to my left. Okay, so here's the first question, or statement, I'm sorry, it's a statement. I had a positive high school mathematics experience. Yes is to the right, no is to my left. Yes, okay. <laughs> here's the next statement, I am just all over the place with this. The next statement is, I had a po positive college or university mathematics experience. Okay. My high school mathematics teachers encouraged me to be successful in their course. Okay. I was encouraged to take advanced level mathematics by my high school teachers. I never, listen carefully, I never took a remedial mathematics course in college. Okay. I was told that I was a high achieving student and led to believe that I should be confident in my skills in mathematics. While taking my high school mathematics courses, I was well informed about how the content connected with my future ideas and career choices. <laughs> okay. Change. Right. Shift in the data. Okay. My high school community, which includes parents, other family members, my neighborhood, my mentors, supported my success in mathematics. <laughs> you could stay indifferent, I guess. And there are two more statements. My community, same group of people, was well informed about the options available for mathematics courses at the high school level. The last question. I was always part of a majority group in my high school mathematics classes. That could be by gender, that could be by race, ethnicity. There are a lot of different majority groups. Now I want you to look around the room. Turn around if you're near the front and look at the data that you have created. And what this tells us about not only our experiences of people who are, we would say, successful in mathematics, successful in our education system, but to me it says what our organization is often talking about and researching on is that mathematics is definitely a cultural activity. And by culture, you can have a seat, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. And so by culture, what we're talking about here, I'm sorry, Dan, I thought I had more room. 
We're talking about those beliefs, experiences, and those attitudes about how mathematics is taught, how it's learned, and what people are exposed to. And so, in the state of Texas, where I'm from, we have a high school mathematics course called Advanced Quantitative Reasoning. And maybe you do in your states as well, or you're de working on developing it. But I'd like you just to take a look at the course description of Advanced Quantitative Reasoning for just a minute, and read through that. So I show you this definition or this course description because I think it's important that as we embark upon this work or continue this work, that we understand that what we are doing is advanced quantitative reasoning for all of the students between grades 11 and 14. So we are using reasoning, we're taking data, we're developing plans and putting in place structures that will be long-term, they're longitudinal, because we want them to develop and apply skills that are necessary for this constantly changing world. And so, I know David had said we don't really have answers, but actually I think we do have some answers, and we are well, in many cases, we are working towards advocacy, changing our marketing structure, how we present to the world what it really means to be quantitatively literate. So through this data, which looks very similar to this particular graph, you created this graph based on your experiences. And there was a quote I heard just a couple of weeks ago about point of view and experience that I wanted to share with you. Every point of view leads you into a different realm of truth. It really depends on perspective. So whether my perspective is that of a state level administrator whether that my perspective is that of a teacher or a professor who is, we'll say, in the trenches every day, or whether I'm a policymaker who generally only goes by data and presentations that come from those groups, there is truth to each perspective. We have to figure out how do we align those truths to really make change. So what is the effect of culture in mathematics? One of the answers and solutions that I'd like to present and a shameless plug, is that the Benjamin Banneker Association has developed a research journal. We call it the Lighthouse Almanac. And within this research journal, one of our authors, if you would stand, Dr. Kendall Brown, is in this room. <laughs> we have worked together. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> we have worked together for many, many years to say that there are solutions to the challenges there are solutions to what people tend to call the ac academic achievement gap, which is often an opportunity gap for many students, many families in this nation. <laughs> there are solutions for how to address that at the classroom level, at the administrative level, and at the community level. And so this is one solution. Dr. Brown and several others in our organization also published a position statement on social justice and teaching mathematics through a social justice approach. So those are just two of these solutions, but in this particular um, journal that was published in December of 2018 is an article by Dr. Lisa Clark Covington of Minnesota. I don't know if we have any Minnesotans in here. Just a couple. So the title of her article is Creating Math Communities in the Neighborhood. It's her research of work that she is currently and has been doing with middle and high school students in conjunction with the University of Minnesota from primarily communities of color. And so what she essentially talks about is saying that race and culture are not only core to the learning process, but they are central forces that organize our society and determine access to high quality mathematics education. So my colleague Dan gave us an excellent definition of mathematical identity, and I have to admit I was a little nervous because I wasn't sure how deeply <laughs> you were gonna go. Um, so I just want to accent this by talking about how race and culture do inform mathematical identity. And I'll provide at the end, I will show you all of the particular references from which this work comes because I never want to plagiarize and take away credit 
from the actual researchers. So we found that obviously mathematical identity does. The participation in math has a profound effect on what we believe about ourselves as learners. It is a social concept. It is developed on a social construct and there are so many factors. That in itself is a multivariable learning experience because there are experiences that we have that impact how we learn. And in the case of students of color, coming into mathematics classrooms can be a very racialized experience. One example of that is that many, we like to say underrepresented a lot, and I have to say thank you to Robert Berry because he was one of the first people um, earlier in my career that introduced me to this language of things that I had experienced as an educator but never really knew how to define. And underrepresented is a really nice way to say there are marginalized students who have been consistently detracted from advanced and high level mathematics and placed in remedial coursework. So how do we, bringing this back to you, how do we put into place structures and procedures to make sure that we are not continuing to do that? So I'll give this example to you. One of the ways that that is done is by building and influencing positive mathematical identities from early mathematics all the way up through high school and college. Benjamin Banneker was a mathematician. He was a scientist. He invented many, many things. He served, um, actually, as a surveyor for the city of Washington, D.C. He is really what we call one of the most renaissance type of mathematicians, the types of mathematicians that we're trying to create today. So when we work with students in a lot of our outreach programs, we present them with this particular mathematics puzzle because Benjamin Banneker also wrote several mathematics puzzles. So since many of us are mathematicians and math teachers, I want to give you a minute just to think about how you would solve this particular problem, and then I'll talk to you about the importance of this particular problem. They want to know about shillings. How many shillings are a pound? <laughs> a question was asked about how many shillings are in a pound. Does anyone know the answer to that question? Say that one more time. Thank you. <laughs> the response was, according to Google, there are 20 shillings in one pound. That is correct. Okay. <laughs> if you're interested, and I will, I'll keep talking and talk about the importance of this to our, our children, Benjamin Banneker's Math Puzzles, this is one of six that is actually available on the AP Central website. So if you Google Benjamin Banneker Puzzles, AP Central, you'll find it there. You'll find suggested answers to many of his puzzles, as well as how the particular author, or which is a teacher, aligned them to grade level expectations. So this particular puzzle is aligned to 10th and 11th grade mathematics expectations based on what we'd say is, and I excuse my pronunciation if it's off, diophantine equations or polynomials, correct? Were there many people that attempted to solve this using polynomials and substitution of integers in that level of mathematics? Okay, just a few. We have a teacher, a, a Benjamin Banneker member, in, who works with students, elementary students in Houston. And she presented this problem to her fourth and fifth grade students 
who were able to solve it pretty quickly. Now, when we look at the data and when we look at these, these students, many of these, this particular school is amongst one of the lowest achieving schools in Texas. These students looking at their data would be some of the lower achieving students in mathematics. But I'll tell you, one of the things that she had done was first in presenting this problem, she did change the language to more 21st century language. Because if we know that there are 20 shillings in a pound, how could we compare that to something that's useful to us today? That's really a question for you all. I, I heard a couple of things and a nickel, a nickel is 1 20th of a dollar. So by presenting dollars and coins, and then understanding that back in the 18th century when Benjamin Banneker wrote this, cattle was generally a term that just described all types of livestock. So instead changing that to cows, chickens, and goats, many of the strategies that those fifth graders already have with modeling, with using manipulatives, and getting to abstract understandings of mathematics at that level, they are learning how to write equations. They solved these puzzles. And they didn't solve them in their class time. This is a group of students that this particular math coach had during lunch. And she said that the students really wanted to use their lunch time to pull out the manipulatives, to pull out their, their notepads, to show their work, because they had built a community where their learning of mathematics was affirmed, where their understanding of mathematics was affirmed, and that the strategies that they used were encouraged. So I tell you this story because what we really want to help, help everyone understand is that these students are not anomalies. They're excellent thinkers. They're excellent thinkers and they're brilliant mathematics students in every state, in every school, and in every classroom. But it is our job to support them, to identify them, and not just the, the David pursues and David, we do love you. But there are many students who don't recognize that they can be Davids but it's our job to cultivate them. So again, the Benjamin Banneker Association is one society within CBMS whose work is consistently about how we can do that in schools and districts and at the community level as well as we work with informal learning spaces such as the Boys and Girls Club and work with staff members there to help them see how everything that they do, everything that they talk about regarding mathematics supports and should align with what we've got going on in schools. So thank you for your time. And you may want to take a picture again. Those are some of the, the research articles that I referenced in the presentation. And just one more slide, Robert, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Bria. So um, next we will have uh, Dr. Marilyn Thanks. Strutchens. And let me see if I can get this going. You go right there, right? So I'll turn it over to Dr. Strutchens. Good morning. Good morning. So my presentation is focused on K-12 education landscape, tracking and detracking. So there have been calls more broadly for STEM literacy. Modern STEM education imparts not only skills such as critical thinking, problem solving, high order thinking, design and inference, but also behavior competencies such as perseverance, adaptability, cooperation, organization and responsibility. Moreover, STEM skills such as computational thinking, problem finding and solving and innovation are crucial for people working to manufacture smart products, improve healthcare and safeguard the nation. And these skills are valuable access, assets across many other fields and job categories. Moreover, as Dr. Berry mentioned this morning, from catalyzing change, 
Calls for mathematical literacy include each and every student should learn the essential mathematical concepts in order to expand professional opportunities, understand and critique the world, and experience the joy and wonder and beauty of mathematics. However, there are many students who are tracked into dead-end courses where they do not get an opportunity to experience the joy and wonder of mathematics, let alone <laughs> develop skills in the mathematics that they need on a day-to-day -day basis or are being prepared for options in terms of career paths. So what I'd like to share with you now is a, an, with my reading glasses on, I can't see anybody. <laughs> but I'm gonna have to put it back on to read. But um, I'd like to share with you a scenario from an article written by Jenny Oates. She's a person that has done a lot of research related to tracking. And actually, this is an article within her article from the New York Times. And it's called The Segregated Classroom of a Proudly Diverse School. Columbia High School seems to have it all. Great sports teams, great academics, famous alumni, and an impressive campus with Gothic buildings. But no one boasts about one aspect of this Blue Ribbon School, that is, its classrooms are largely segregated. Though the school is majority black, white students make up the bulk of the advanced classes, while black students far outnumber whites in lower classes, statistics show. It's kind of sad, a senior who is president of the senior council said, you can tell right away just by looking into a classroom what level it is. This is a reality at many high schools coast to coast. Educators say that leveling allows smarter students to be challenged while giving struggling ones the special instruction they need. But many students, especially those in lower levels, which often carry a stigma, say stratifications makes the rocky adolescent years only harder. And at Columbia High, there is no dispute that it is precisely the leveling system that has led to racial segregation. The superintendent of the district acknowledged that there were, in a sense, two Columbias. The de facto segregation is most visible at the extremes. Statistics for this year show that while a level five math class, the highest had 79% white students, a level two math class, the lowest, had 88% black students. Levels three and four tend to be more mixed, though a school board member said some white parents tell me that they know their kid belongs in a level three class but they don't want them to be the only white kid in the class. A senior whose father is from Guyana and whose mother is Swiss said that some teachers do seem to have lower expectations for black students, but that he did not let them get him down. And in a way, he sympathizes with the principal. He said, she's got an entire black population that wants to get rid of the leveling system and an entire white population who would leave this town if they did that. So what's the principal supposed to do? How many of you know of schools where this situation exists? And as a provider of professional development, I often go into school systems where this is a reality for many students. And it's sad that you can tell what level a class is based on the students who are in the class. This should not be. So catalyzing change, and again, these are key recommendations that you've heard from Dr. Berry. And I have been struck throughout my whole time here how much there's overlap in a lot of our presentations, but we can't help but for it to be that way because of the issues that we are addressing. And so the key recommendations state, high school mathematics should discontinue the practice of tracking teachers 
as well as the practice of tracking students into quali qualitatively different or dead-end course pathways. And Robert's gonna talk more about tracking teachers, so I'm gonna focus on, on the students. High schools should offer continuous four-year mathematics pathways with all students stu studying in mathematics each year, including two to three years of mathematics in a common shared pathway, focusing on the essential concepts to ensure the highest quality mathematics education for all students. And here again, these are significant structural barriers within educators' sphere of influence. Tracking students into course pathways that do not prepare students for continuous study of, study of mathematics. Tracking teachers in ways that deny certain students access to high quality instruction. And then providing inadequate instructional supports both before and during high school. And this is a, um, a, a table from a document caught from the United States Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, Civil Rights Data Collection from 2015 to 2016. And you can see in green the schools that are predominantly African American and Latinx, they offer less courses that are at the upper levels. They have less advanced mathematics courses. And you can see they're in a, in a range with the other high schools in terms of Algebra one. but when you get to calculus, those schools that are 75% black offer only, calculus is offered in about 38% of those schools. And so a lot of students, a lot of students don't necessarily have access to calculus. They don't have a choice of taking it because it's not in their schools. And then just as so just as I presented you with some troubling information, I'd also like to present you with some hopeful information. <laughs> and um, and these are examples of effective mathematics departments from the research. Um, Railside High School, as talked about by Bowler and Staples, they talk about how teachers really worked across the grades. Um, this morning, Dr. Berry talked about a balance between teachers teaching both upper and lower courses so that all of the students all experience different teachers and all of the teachers own the students. And then Union High School by Rochelle Gutierrez, they um, experienced some same kind of structures within that school. Monterey High, as discussed by Rochelle Gutierrez, and then East High School, as discussed by Lena Horn. So these are some of the characteristics of the effective mathematics departments. Effective mathematics learning communities, they have a teacher collective, as I stated, where they, all of the teachers work with all of the students and they own all of the students. More advanced level courses than lower level courses with high expectations that students will matriculate through the course as well. Teachers who use pedagogical strategies aimed at engaging all students in learning meaningful mathematics. And these pedagogical practices are in alignment with the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics and other calls for reform that include more problem solving, more reasoning and sense making of mathematics that really focus on the standards for mathematical practice. Also using cooperative learning groups and not just putting students in groups, but helping students to learn how to work effectively in groups by using complex instruction um, as designed by Elizabeth Cohen and, group and others. Within complex instruction, the teacher ensures that all of the students are participating in the activity. And students who might have low status among other students are raised up by the teacher. And, and the teacher asks the other students to pay attention to that student. And then sometimes the students that have lower status are some of those students that actually think outside of the box. And so within complex instruction environments, students become interdependent upon each other and they begin to really respect each other's thoughts and beliefs around mathematics. And then also applying culturally relevant practices 
And today, oftentimes, people talk more about culturally sustaining practices where all students are valued. And, and as um, the, we have to get your, your last name, Radcliffe. Dr. Radcliffe. As Dr. Rad Radcliffe talked about um, the importance of using social justice lesson, this is an example of um, a social lesson, social justice lesson that students experienced in a AP statistics class where the majority of the students were white, but they got an opportunity to really think about the disproportionate number of students in terms of African Americans who are at the school who are not in those upper level classes. And some of the students had some um, deficit beliefs about why the African-American students weren't in the upper level classes. But then when some of the other poor students started talking about um, why that might be the case, they began to have more empathy towards students. And then through their data project, they realized that um, students needed more of an opportunity to take advanced classes. So they took their data to the principal and he enabled double periods for students who wanted to catch up with their mathematics. And so students became not only problem solving agents, but they became agents for other students in their building. And then this is an example, um, Dr. Berry mentioned this morning that Alabama, Alabama's course of study committee is working on a proposed plan of or proposed pathway for students that is different from the traditional pathways. And you can see that they also have a common experience with geometry in the ninth grade, um, news course names to emphasize that they are not the same old, same old, same content for all students through Algebra two. So in geometry, there's a common course for all students and then they begin to split out later. And then also one of the things that the course of study has really worked on is providing a fourth year. And what they did was they backed into the fourth year courses by looking at careers so that students have a goal of where they're going and that the courses are built on where students might land versus just thinking about possible courses and then hoping that they will match careers later. And then as Dan mentioned, and also um, as Dr. Tease and Dr. Radcliffe, I know everybody by first names. <laughs> so trying to remember and keep up with their last names is interesting. But, uh, <laughs> but each of us have talked about identity. And according to Nasir, the relationship between learning and identity is bi-directional, with access to learning supporting stronger identities and identity in turn supporting learning. And this is an example from um, Frank and Hickson's um, from Access and Equity Promoting High Quality Mathematics in Grades 9 through 12. And this student's name is Terika, and she is an African-American student who had thought about calculus as being only for the whiz kids. She didn't think that she could be successful in that class, and her grades weren't like straight A's, because most people think students who make straight A's are the ones who are gonna go into calculus. She had about a B average, but her teacher, Ms. Hickson, believed that she could do well in calculus. And she ended up at the end of the semester doing a report and presenting to, class, to her class with a lot of poise and confidence a, a topic that she had not even studied within that class to her peers and did it really well. And then at the end, she saw that she was really capable of succeeding in calculus. And so we can turn things around because it's not only policies that hold students back, it's what students come to believe about themselves and they select courses that are less rigorous because of stereotypes and beliefs that are not just held by other people, but they're also held by students 
because of what they come accustomed to over the years. And so we can't just wait until high school to start billing students' mathematics identities as Dr. Radcliffe presented with the elementary students. We have to start early on with that vertical alignment. And then um, this is just showing that throughout the years, NCTM and other organizations have called for changes in, in the teaching and learning of mathematics in grades K through 12 with more problem solving and reasoning and making sense, along with the Common Core State Standards. And then, um, as you all heard today from several of the organizations, um, different reports calling for changes, not only at the K-12 level, but at the college level as well. And then NCT, N, NSF has sponsored a lot of projects around broadening participation. And so the time is now. It's time to close the opportunity gap. We have some examples of how to do it. Um, it's time for K-12 and higher education to work together to ensure that each and every student has access to meaningful mathematics and are empowered to go into the profession of his or her choice. And it is time to scale up those practices which lead to more student engagement and higher achievement in mathematics. Thank you. All right, I, I feel like I need to play Sam Cooke's The Change Gonna Come. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I mean then, right? All right, cool, that's all, all right. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm in a fortunate position because I, I, I'm, I'm last, and so, and the fortunate thing is that as um, Dr. Strutchins and and the, all of the panelists have, <laughs> have mentioned, so <laughs> that, I'm, I'm losing names now. Here we go. I'm going to call y'all by y'all first names. Okay, that all right? Okay, okay, all right, right. cool. <laughs> all right, so, so um, this morning I talked about catalyzing change. And I actually want to kind of back up a little bit and dig a little bit deeper with catalyzing change. And the reason why I want to dig a little bit deeper with catalyzing change is it's just kind of, you know, it is a conversation. And I think this is a point where we begin to have conversations about issues that impact high school mathematics. But also, for those of you who are familiar with catalyzing change, NCTM is also working on two other publications that will be catalyzing change in early, early childhood and elementary and catalyzing change for middle school as well. And so those issues that impact early childhood and elementary, you know, we, we're going to initiate conversations in, in that space and also the same with middle school. And so I'm gonna borrow and, and talk about some of the issues right now about high school, but might uh, flow back a little bit to the other grade bands as well. So, when we think about why catalyzing change and where that conversation comes from and things of that sort, I mean, if you take a look here, I mean, if you look at this graph and you look at this graph, this represents the trends from fourth grade and eighth grade on NAEP, uh, on the NAEP assessment, and you look from 96 to 2017. While the slope is not as steep as we like, we can see that the slope is positive. It is positive and, and, and moving um, forward in positive way. So we can see um, with the darker blue color, we see fourth grade. Again, where we're in, in 96. And then looking on in terms of looking at the standard deviation from 96, you can see that there's been, I would say, you know, 2015, 2017, it's kind of flattened out, but it's not yet a trend. But we, we still see overall through that time period uh, a positive slope. The question now becomes, so if that's fourth and eighth grade, what does it look like in high school? You know, I, I guess the good news is it's not a negative slope. Um, but the more challenging news, what is it that what's happening while there is some positive impact in, in fourth and eighth grade, what is happening in high school where the slope is relatively flat? 
And oftentimes, in Catalyzing Change, we talk about this as an implementation gap. And an implementation gap, uh, we refer to it as a way of how can we impact teaching and learning of mathematics in the ways that's happening in fourth and eighth grade that may not yet have been realized in, in 12th grade or in high school. And so that realization on you know, the use of tools, the use of discourse in classrooms, the idea of students connecting to one another. How do we build engaging classrooms that students are, are, in, are collaborating with one another in a way that, that we see some positive impacts in fourth and eighth grade, but not yet realized in high school. And so those are the things that we, when we say the implementation gap, those are the things that we're talking about. But we also know what happens in high school mathematics, as Dr. Strutchin mentioned earlier, with regards to tracking. Um, that tracking happens much sooner than kids, uh, than, than high school. And, and so we know that in elementary, sometimes we refer to it as, as, as grouping, you know, and the uh, language of grouping that happens in elementary schools. When we say grouping, you know, how, you know, you know I, I've been in a class, school where we have the red birds, the blue birds, and the eagles, and it's not, you know, that's not a mystery who the eagles are, right? <laughs> you know, so I want to know how do you distinguish the red and the blue birds? Um, and so it is it's one of those things when we think about relatively grouping that happens in elementary. In the same way that grouping now has impact of what happens in, in, in middle grades. And when we think about the grouping in middle grades, now, now we're, we're thinking about courses. In, in elementary, we're thinking about grade, le grade bands, and sometimes there is departmentalization that happens in elementary, but now we move to middle school where we're thinking about courses and, and students are grouped in courses where there is a, you know, in some places, I'm hearing some places where there is uh, sixth grade algebra one. I'm like, whoa, wow, that, that is very interesting. And then, but more, more likely you might have an on grade level course, and then you have what it might be a sixth grade compress. How many of you heard the language of compress courses? So it might be sixth and seventh grade compressed, and sixth grade, and kids are taking those kinds of courses. So, kind of got off track a little bit with the tracking, but you know, I want to get back on track in terms of making a case and why we want, need to have th these, these conversations. And so, when we look at PISA, and PISA is the Program for International Student Assessment. Uh, the U.S. Is, is trailing behind, behind its international peers. And we know that young adults are not, not only, you know, lack preparation in numeracy and problem solving, but also mathematics to be participatory in a, in a democratic society. Um, Matt Larson and I wrote a, a, an article in uh, PDK, uh, Phi Delta Cap in the magazine, and in that article, we bring up this whole notion of, of truth decay. And the idea of truth decay is the idea how, how we make sense and understand data. We're bombarded every day with data. And how do we prepare students to make sense and understand the kinds of data and understand what the representat representation of the data, is it truthful or is it mischaracterizing something uh, in, in some ways. And when I work with kids, I love to use, I hope no one's from USA Today here, but I love to use the USA Today as an example of unpacking representation of data. Because, you know, sometimes there's some scale issues um, with looking at data, but also just, I want kids to be critical consumers. Mm -hmm. Critical consumers of the data that they receive daily. And I think that's how we use mathematics, to make sense, to critique the world. And I, I would argue it helps them experience the joy, wonder, and beauty of mathematics as well. So when we think about our math curriculum, you know, some of you may ask, so, well, why? Have, have, have you ever thought of why, why algebra one, geometry, algebra two? Why that sequence, and where did that come from? Well, actually, that comes from the Committee of Ten in 1892. And many places are still using that sequence of study since 1892. I'm going to make an argument. We've learned a lot since 1892. 
And, and because we've learned a lot since 1892, it might be time to rethink and renegotiate, you know, course sequence and even how concepts are packaged, whether they're in courses or whether how they're linked. But I think it's up for conversation, and we need to initiate that conversation to think about, do we do what happened in 1892 with regards to course sequence, or do we need a net now to have another conversation about, you know, it may have worked well during that time, and we can argue about that, you know, I, I, whether it worked well during that time. But we, I, I do think it's up for discussion now to really think about the course sequence from 1892. Um, but if we think about what happened in the 90s, and you think about the NSF-funded curricula that happened in the 90s, there was some effort in the mid to early 90s to push on or push back on the, the sequence of courses from 1892 and, and was re really renegotiating the ideas of how concepts link to one another. And these curriculum materials, you know, connected mathematics materials and, and other materials that were developed during that time was kind of the space of, you know, giving access to thinking about how mathematics contents could be sequenced differently than that was prescribed in 1892. Unfortunately, I still think that we need to pick up that conversation again, you know, nearly 20 years later, um, because I still think that conversation needs to happen, uh, and we may, whether it's is that those sequence of courses or curricula at that time or something different? We just have to have a conversation about content and curricula that help that bring broader access to many students. So, so the answer to these questions, I mean, I mean, it's not you know requiring less mathematics. I think it's you know this space where we have to identify and confront come the long overdue changes in structures and policies and structural approaches and relevance to high school mathematics. I think we have to have this conversation um, about what are the things that need to change, what are the, some of those things that we need to put on the table, and what are those things that um, we can do without. And so, as others have mentioned, and I mentioned earlier this morning, NCTM has four key recommendations that initiate this conversation. And I'm not, I'm not gonna rehash those four re recommendations, but what I would like to do is just kinda highlight a few things from, from those recommendations. Um, the first being the purpose of learning mathematics. And uh, as, as Dr. Strutch has men mentioned earlier, it is critiquing and understanding the world, experience the joy, wonder, and beauty of mathematics, and helping students prepare what, for whatever professional or personal endeavors they see for themselves in their future. Um, and so what happens when we think about teacher and teacher tracking, there is a lot of content in high school mathematics. And I think we have to have this conversation about what are the essential ideas in high school mathematics. That because it's, sometimes it's not necessarily the rigor, the, the rigor is, 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 is just really the vast amount of content that could be, that is overwhelming in a high school curriculum. And we have to really think about what are those essential things that should be in a high school curriculum as students move forward. When we think about equitable structures, I mentioned this earlier this morning, about the issues around tracking, particularly around teacher tracking. Again, our most experienced teachers are in the upper, upper level mathematics courses, and our least experienced uh, teachers are teaching the entry level mathematics courses. And notice I use the term entry level and not lower level because I think we have to have disrupt this idea of deficit language. And I want to disrupt this idea of deficit, because we want students all to enter, when I mentioned in, in, in the, I'm losing my thought here, in Catalyzing Change, we talk about a common pathway. All students enter high school mathematics in the same way. So those are entry level courses. So they enter through this common pathway. And so I want to disrupt this notion of the lower level uh, as uh, lower and, and higher, but maybe there's an entry level and an upper level as students enter through the common pathway and progress through the pathway of mathematics. And equitable instruction, as mentioned by our panelists, the idea of identity and agency plays out in very significant ways uh, as we think about, uh, uh, about that. 
And finally, the fourth recommendation is about the pathways. I mentioned this, uh, uh, we mentioned this has already been discussed in terms of some students are in what we call dead end terminal pathways that don't lead them to, and here's the thing, when we think about mathematics courses and we think about sequence of courses, we also have to consider, well, what is a math course? A math course might, it could be defined as a course that prepares students for the continued study of mathematics. If this course does not prepare students for the continued study of mathematics, whether formally or informally, we might have to think about whether that is a mathematics, mathematics course. It is also a course that has significant mathematics standards. It also, have, it also has significant mathematical experiences. And so if students are not prepared for the continued study of mathematics, then we have to really think about is this a significant mathematics experience or math course. So, I want to close out with actions and things that you, I think that you, that we all should do. So I have actions for teachers, school districts, and, and policy makers. So when we think about teachers in school districts, um, schools and districts, I think we have to analyze and evaluate the systemic policies and practices and procedures that restrict students' access to and success in mathematics. What are those things that are restrictive? What are those things that allow some students to continue on to study uh, through the upper, uh, upper levels of mathematics, and what are those things that restrict some students? I think we have to analyze teacher assignments. We argue for a balanced approach, and, and a balanced approach would be an entry level and an upper level, and that the distribution of responsibility is shared among all members in a mathematics department, and all members, um, one can argue, at a school. We also argue for consistently implementing uh, research-informed and equity-based instructional practices. And in Catalyzing Change, we, make, we, we use the eight effective teaching practices from principles to action as we unpack, unpack those ideas as related to identity and agency. So for pol policy makers, I think for policy makers, we have to develop policies that support meaningful four-year pathways that support students' learning of the essential concepts. Again, this is a discussion about pathways. What are those things that w we want students to continue to study mathematics? And it, it might mean negotiating what are some of those courses um, that support students' thinking. It, it would be great to think about some of these interactions between some of our CTE types of courses and mathematics courses. It would be great to think about how can we use statistics in, in interesting and different ways that might connect with students' interests. It would be great to think about the idea of functions and how functions play out across uh, different areas of mathematics and what they mean, how they relate differently and similarly. So th it is really having that, that, that discussion. Policymakers, developing policies that support the study of mathematics so that all students have professional opportunities, can understand, critique the world, and experience the joy, wonder, and beauty of mathematics. Wouldn't it be great if all of our students left high school having a sense of joy, wonder, and beauty? And one might argue that many of our students don't have that sense of joy, wonder, and beauty as it relates to mathematics. I know I didn't when I left high school mathematics. I don't think I experienced joy, wonder, and beauty until I got into graduate school. I just persisted. I hung in there. I survived. And I don't want any child to go through high school or even college or even graduate school saying that they survived mathematics. I think we have to figure out a way that, 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 that we can build in ways that students want to persist and experience that joy and that wonder and curiosity and beauty of mathematics. I think we have to de-emphasize the race to calculus, and this is a biggie. I mean, we've heard that language, we've heard from Dan, we've heard from Yuri, the race to cal calculus. We have to de-emphasize the race to calculus. And that means having a conversation about calculus and statistics and, uh, and, and, and what pathways might mean in terms of student preparation. And finally, I think we should develop assessments that align with and emphasize the essential concepts. And so how do we measure that? And what data do we knew, need to get at those things? So I'm going to stop here. We have time to take questions, and I'm going to join my panelists here. Well, I'll stand here, and then I'll distribute questions. That way I can probably <laughs> So right now, so here we go. Uh, so, so I am a university professor.
And so one of the things I do in my, my message course, when, and sometimes I, I, I ask, questions or compliments? So we will take <laughs> questions or compliments because we can, they're, they're, it's a pedagogical thing. So right here, here's a question or a compliment. And a compliment, rather. <laughs> So the question is, what is being done at the K-12 level in terms of students taking ownership of their own learning? I'll turn to my colleagues here. Well, I think one, one thing that, that, that's happening in a lot of places in a lot of different ways is, is moving to a more active learning uh, representation for how mathematics is, is done. So that students, ha I mean, first of all, in order for them to take ownership of their own learning, they have to believe that that is possible, that, that, that it's a real thing, uh, that mathematics is understandable uh, rather than something that's just memorable. So I think sort of building this belief that, that yeah, we can figure this out. It, it may be not something we haven't seen yet, but we can, based on what we know, what do we think it's going to be? Um, and then sort of clarify their, their ideas, but, but I think a lot of the, the developing the ideas with the students um, is is a part of that process of them saying, no, I can I can actually do this. And so I, th I think that's important. I think it's important too for us to be honest about the fact that at the K-12 level, we're still very challenged by that. And I think one of the challenges also is in our definition of what ownership really means. Are we talking about ownership of the content of learning mathematics? Are we talking about ownership and whether or not you're completing all of the assignments on time and you're taking, I guess, ownership and accountability we probably need to better define that, but we, we're still challenged by that too. And I agree with both Dan and Bria, and one of the things that we really focus a lot on, I'm a mathematics teacher educator and I work with pre-service teachers, and we focus a lot on them using the, the mathematical teaching practices um, advocated by the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. And a part of those eight mathematics teaching practices is supporting productive struggle. And then helping students to, act to assess their own learning. And then we're finding that the more teachers use those eight mathematics teaching practices and really use them well with students, that students are beginning to take ownership of their own mathematics because the teachers are questioning them in a way that's not funneling them to answers, but getting them to really think about what they are doing. And so if there's a, a trend, you know, helping students to move from, um, and people have talked about this early on, about changing the culture of what it means to learn mathematics. Mm -hmm. if, if all we've had students do over the years is memorize and regurgitate, then when they get to college, they're not gonna be able to take a problem and think about it in the way that mathematicians want them to think about um, stop doing a proof and all of that. But if we start in the elementary grades through high school, really helping students to um, participate in active learning, as Dan mentioned, and if teachers are using the pedagogical practices that, that we've talked about, we can have students to own the mathematics because of the experiences that they participate in. But if they're just learning it in a traditional way, it's just like memorizing a poem that you don't really understand. Right. So, so let me add one, one more thing. That, uh, I'm a high school teacher, and our, our school has a, has a metaphor that, that this is not my idea. It's one of the, came from one of the teachers we, we recently hired that, uh, that I think might be helpful. Because we, we tell the students that taking a mathematics course taking any course, but particularly a mathematics course, is like being given a Lego, one Lego each day. And your job is to be able to hold all these Legos at the end of the year. And, and so how is that possible? How, <laughs> the only way that's possible is for you to connect them. Mm 
And it's your job to make those connections. Oh, this is related to this. This fits in with that. These two fit together. So I don't really have five Legos here. I've really got four Legos that are connected and one that's still floating out here that maybe tomorrow I can connect it with something else. As a, as a metaphor for building your understanding and your responsibility for making those connections will be helpful, of course. Uh, but in the end, it's really the connections that you are able to make with all these ideas that are going to be the foundation from which you build your mathematical future. So that, that's one way of trying to express that to the students. And I will add to this idea of ownership. I mean, so the idea of students owning the mathematics, and one thing I, I would push back on teachers, how do you own your students? Mm -hmm. And when I say own your students in the sense of how do we honor who they are and how yes. they come to us in our classrooms, and what do we do to support how they come to us. They come to us how they come to us. Right. And, 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 and how do we take ownership of that? And what do we do to support and move them forward in that space? It's about relationship building. Mm -hmm. And how do we build relationships with students? And how, you know, and from that relationship, there's, a, there's this now this connection. I mean, I, my research focuses on black boys. And I tell my boys all the time, y'all built this. This come from you. Uh, so. Um, and so, you know, we own this. It was stolen from us. And so with that sense of efficacy that comes from that um, is it, something I want to give them ownership. This is ancestral. This came from us and, 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 and think about that and what that might mean and how do you honor those folks who came before you. Mm. And so that sense of ownership is how do I build those relationships with my students and how then how do I help them? How do I create a gateway for them to build a relationship with the mathematics? I'm, I, there's a question here. So yeah, in science, the, the, there's, there's a, this interesting movement that's happening in science with regards to really focusing on those critical areas. Um, and so what's happening in mathematics, we're, we're focusing on the kind of the big ideas, and from that, the big ideas, standards can, can, can come from those big ideas. But also, there has to be a discussion. There's a lot, one could argue there's a lot of content in high school mathematics. And, and how do we think about the sequencing of, of concepts and content in such a way that students can see the connections? Too often mathematics is presented as discrete, they're not linked, they're discrete contents. And so I think we can do a better job of linking ideas together. I use the, uh, the example of functions. I mean, we have trig function, algebraic function, geometric functions. I mean, there are some things that we can link together, but sometimes they're taught in discrete ways that they, students don't see the connections among them. And because of the way courses are sequenced, there's not an opportunity to make those connections unless you do it outside of the <laughs> ways the courses have been designed. Mm -hmm. And so we have to really be purposeful in thinking about that. And so I just, I want to raise the bar that for us in the mathematics education community and the mathematics community, let's have this conversation. Let's have this conversation uh, about essential concepts and critical areas that we could have in high school mathematics in a way that I think we've done a better job in, 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 in K-8. I think we've done a little bit better job in K-8, not as well as we've done for high school. I go, oh wow, I'm work, I, Kendall, then I'll work my way around.
I think we have to change the system. It can't just rest on a few teachers. And, and I agree with you, like oftentimes in research, we have people who have funding who can go out and change a department because they have funding to help them change. But then at the same time that we're working with the math departments, we also have to work with the administrators and the districts so that when the work is done, it can, it's not just resting on the teachers that we just provided the PD to, that it's a part of what the system believes should happen in order to maintain it. And that's why it's important to have courses of study that advocate different course pathways and that advocate particular types of pedagogy for students learning mathematics and science. So it can't just rest within um, a, funded program, a funded project coming in and changing a school. It has to be systemic overall. In the middle, right here. So, so in, in, in K-8, so one of the things, um, just to provide a little bit more context, in K-8, I mean, so Common Core has been mentioned, and in the Common Core, there are critical areas of focus in K-8 in a way that they weren't presented in high school. And so one of the reasons why in Catalyzing Change was because there were critical areas of focus um, uh, in that K-8 area, we need a, we use the term essential concept that, that's analogous with this critical area of focus. The other thing the NCTM has done back in the early 2000s was have the, uh, the curricular focal points. And those focus on some critical areas in, in K-8 mathematics as well. But to the point of the idea of basics, um, it make, it, it, I am thinking about the issue around tracking. Too often what happens when students are tracked, there, there, there's some content and there's some areas that are skipped. And I'm wondering, are there critical areas that are skipped? We know that in some places, uh, proportional reasoning in middle school is often a skipped content as kids move to Algebra 1 too soon. We also know that some of the issues are digging deeper. So the idea, if we detract, it, it would provide us with the opportunities to dig deeper in content that we know that students need continue depth and understanding, building up their conceptual understanding around these ideas. And so, um, the I, so, I'm want, so I wonder if this is a residual uh, of perhaps tracking. And I, I'm, I'm not certain of the context in Germany as well. Can I just add to that? Yeah. I know in my experience in helping to, with teacher development, I've seen that 
building on what you said in certain classrooms, not all teachers understand that though the concept is, we'll say, foundational, that the cognitive complexity should be different at every level and every stage of how the mathematics is taught. So we may talk about surface area maybe in sixth and seventh grade, and it appears again in the geometry curriculum, but what you taught in sixth and seventh grade is not that same level of surface area at that level. And I think that's something that continually should be addressed um, in a lot of our teacher development. Here, then April, about right here in the white shirt, and then I'll come to you, April. I think, um, like I've participated in math science partnership, we had one for over almost eight years working with teachers. And one of the things that we found was really putting them in problem solving situations where they had to really think about the mathematics in different ways, K through 12 teachers. And sometimes having K through 12 teachers solving the same math problems and seeing how they solved it from different perspectives. And it was really interesting because sometimes the elementary teachers would solve a problem just by drawing a picture and, it, and, and their solution was really strong. And um, a mathematician or a, or a 12th grade teacher would solve that same problem using algebra and it was a long string of algebraic symbols and the elementary teacher was like, why? <laughs> you know. But, but the same thing is that they were both challenged to think about that same problem and to solve it from their perspective. And the elementary teachers grew through that process of having challenged problems. And some of the problems um, they could even use in their classroom, but they were non-routine problems or problems that they hadn't seen before and they had to think about them in a different way. And it caused them to really think about mathematics from a standpoint of not just memorizing rules and formulas, but really having to reason and make sense of them for themselves. And there are people who have developed math circles and all kinds of other things to engage teachers in problem solving and thinking about mathematics differently. And even um, having teachers to participate in social justice lessons and other kinds of lessons that they have not experienced before to really think about mathematics and, and what it means to really learn mathematics. So I'm going to add to that. One of the things that I think we, are, we essentially have to do as a community is get into the advocacy space. Mm -hmm. When I say get into the advocacy space, when we look at the last uh, administration budget as it relates to professional development and mathematics, it was zeroed out. We have to rise up on that. And, and when we think about you know, how Eisenhower money was back in, in, in the early 2000s and things of that sort, it is that there's not funding to do those kinds of things. And so we need, we, need to, we need to be in this advocacy space so that we can advocate for funding to support teachers to do the kinds of things that we know that will have a positive impact on students' experiences and, and teachers' experiences in mathematics. And so in order for that to happen, we need money in the space for that to happen. And so I think we have to get into this advocacy space to push back on the kinds of federal budgets that come forward as relate to professional development for education. April?
So last comment, the last comment, Dex. Can I say one okay, So right. just to, to the, the last two comments, the, the one key is that you have to do this slowly, but you, but you have to get started. That you, you guys are going to talk this weekend and make some plans for how your state's going to be moving forward. Mm -hmm. And when you get your plan done, your teachers aren't going to be ready for it. And so the question is, my question to you is, so you know your teachers aren't ready for it, what do you do? Right. Uh, do you go ahead with it? Um, and hope for the best. I mean, so, so as you're organizing yourselves, you need to be thinking about how do, we, how do we help the teachers? How do we move them forward? How do we get them ready to do what we're doing? Because what you're, what we're, you're, most of us operate on, in the, in the context we live in, uh, as efficiently as possible, which means your, your current programs are on a local optimum value. Given the current structure, this is, we're doing as well as we can do. And you want to move it up to a higher place. But we, we know as mathematicians that I can't go from here to there without going down. If I'm at an optimum <laughs> value here, mm -hmm. I've got to go down before I can go up. Mm -hmm. And so don't expect immediate results the, next, the first year you Sorry. implement something to have this roaring success because they're going to be uncomfortable implementing it. They're not going to be really sure what they're doing. Um, and it's going to take some time. You need to give them time and space to develop themselves if they're going to if you're going to be successful. Right. All right, cool. So we're three minutes over, I and I think we're between now, you and lunch. So yeah. hope you guys have. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. you know,